purpose God has for us, that is, what it is that God wants to accomplish in us today as members of the body of Christ. Now, this is a, a chart of what we're studying on uh, Tuesdays, and we'll resume that this Tuesday. And if you see some things written in there of interest, well, come Tuesday, and, and uh, you'll see that we'll conclude it. We've got to put point five in there. Uh, but I put it up there because I want you to see that chart. Uh, the way I write it is a little bit differently, and I don't know. Can you see it in the back row? Or does it just kind of blend together because it's so small? If I was making that chart for you, I would have made it in the center and kind of stretched it out a little bit. But uh, this timeline up here is what I wanted you to see. And uh, eventually I'll put up a, a bigger chart for you to see it in a different way in just a few minutes. Uh, but we are going to look at about our course. And uh, we've been talking about, or I should say, your course. And as an individual, God has saved us. And he saved us for a reason. And we've been studying for some time all the different things that uh, our course in life contain and, and what we're responsible for. And uh, we're going to conclude it by what God gives us a title. He gives us a, a, a title of ambassador. And uh, but before we do, we want to contrast that with the nation of Israel and what God called the nation of Israel to be. In Genesis chapter 12, I was going to tell you that in the Bibles in front of you, there's a, a Bible there in the pew in front of you or in the personal Bible that you might have brought, if we're going to look at a lot of verses and you have a hard time finding your way through, that's okay. Uh, but there's a little help for you. In the first few pages of your Bible will be a table of contents. And it'll tell you what chapter every book begins, or what page number every book begins at. And uh, so you can quickly, if you put a marker there, you can quickly find your way to other places in the Bible. So take advantage of that uh, little help there. In Genesis chapter 12, God calls out Abraham and he says this. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, later on his name is extended to be Abraham, it's the same person that I'm referring to when I talk about Abraham. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy, thy father's house, into a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing." And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do ask your help as we approach your Bible, that we might see in truth what it is and what it has to say, and where in it that it speaks directly to us. And then, Father, help us to be responsible, uh, first to trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, to make that good judgment, and then, Father, to realize that we are now to live for your glory. And we pray that you might work some things in our life today for your eternal purpose, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. In Genesis chapter 12, one of, the, one of the things that a lot of people, when they read their Bible and realize that most of your Bible is about the nation of Israel, and they are called God's chosen people. It, it, just a lady at the conference asked me about it, and I get asked quite often, why did God choose the nation of Israel? Why them? And one of the things that some people overlook is the fact that when you read this, it said there in verse 2, when God separated Abraham out, he said, I will make of thee a great nation. He didn't just look among all the nations of the earth and say, hmm, I think I'll take Israel and, and deal with them. No, there was no such thing as Israel when the nations of the earth were divided. God took Abraham and said, get away from your country, get away from your people, get away from your land, get away from your family, come to a land that I'm going to give you, and there in that land I'm going to make out of you a great nation. So God created the nation of Israel. God made the nation of Israel. And his purpose in making the nation of Israel is found in verse 3. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, just to give you a quick view of what took place just before Genesis 12, Genesis 11 is about the Tower of Babel. And that's where the nations of the earth gathered together to build a tower whose top might reach unto heaven. And what they began to do is worship God out of the imagination of their own minds. And in that imagination of their minds, they started making images of birds and to four-footed beasts, to man and to even creeping things. And they began to invent their own forms of worshiping God. And the, their forms of worshiping God wasn't worshiping Him in spirit or in truth. And God took and He divided the nations. He just he went down to where they were, confused their languages, and divided the nations of the earth. When they are divided up, since they had turned from God, none of them know God. So there isn't a testimony of God in the earth. And God takes Abraham, reveals Himself to Abraham, 
and says, I'm going to make a great nation out of you, and in you, that is in his seed, in the nation of Israel, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. God was going to use the nation of Israel to show the, the, the nations of the world who the real God is because Israel's God was going to be the true and living God. They didn't worship idols, not allowed to worship an idol. And God was going to bless them until such a point that the nations would say, you know, the God of Israel is a real God. And then they would come to God through the nation of Israel and the nation of Israel would minister to the Gentiles. That is God's purpose in creating the nation of Israel, to win the nations back to himself. Well, you know, you read your Bible and, and everything from, uh, from Genesis to the book of Acts, a big section of your Bible, God is dealing with the nation of Israel because he can't get them to be. Now, that's the wrong term. <laughs> they refuse to be. He can get them to be. <laughs> they refuse to be the testimony. They kept wanting to be like the other nations and God had to judge them. And he's always working with them to make them what he wanted them to be. Once they're finally what they ought to be, then they can, he'll use them for his purpose. Now look at Exodus chapter 19. That's Genesis, Exodus. That one's easy to find. The second book of the Old Testament. And you come to chapter 19. Israel has multiplied into a great number of people. There's a couple million people that Moses is leading out of Egypt and leading them to the promised land. And uh, as they're going, God says this in Exodus chapter 19 in verse 3. It says, uh, and Moses went up unto God, uh, uh, and, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say unto the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Now Israel's forefathers is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God changed Jacob's name to Israel and gave him twelve sons, which make the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. That's why the reference to Jacob here. He is their father, uh, as he is Abraham's grandson. So, so tell the children of Israel, he says in verse 4, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagle's wing, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine." And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. God promised them that if they would keep his laws, that they would be above all the other people of the earth. In the sense that they are going to be rulers of all the nations of the, of the earth. And they are also called in verse 6 that they are going to be not only a kingdom, they're rulers with Christ, but a kingdom of priests that they are going to be the means that, that stand between holy God and the sinful Gentiles. It's going to be the Jewish people that are going to be able to come and stand before God, but bring the sinful Gentiles and bring them back into reconciliation with God. They are going to be a nation of priests. That's what God set them apart to be. So they are a kingdom of priests. They're going to rule, and then they're going to minister as priests to the nations. But before he does that, they have to obey his laws and keep his commandments, and then they're going to be cleansed so that they can then minister to us Gentiles who are over there worshiping cows and worshiping trees and worshiping stones, things of our hands that we have created to worship instead of worshiping the God of truth. And so the nation of Israel has this special relationship with God, and I want you to understand that they are called throughout the Bible God's purpose for them in the earth. He calls them a kingdom of priests. So they're kings and priests uh, in the earth. You notice the reference to the earth. He says that in verse 5 there. He says, uh, now, therefore, uh, no, now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. The Gentiles didn't declare that it was God's. They went off and, and invented their own God to worship, but God says, the earth is mine. And because it's mine, I can give you this land, and I can make you a great nation, and I will win the Gentiles back to me. God is going to restore this earth under his authority through the nation of Israel. That's why they're called a kingdom of priests. This earth right now, even to this day, is not under the rule of God. They're not putting themselves under the authority of God. But someday this earth will be brought to its knees in a judgment, and Jesus Christ is going to return to this earth, and this earth is His, and He will rule over it. 
Right now, the Bible says Satan is the god of this world. And that's why you see the evil that's all in the world. But God is going to use the nation of Israel to restore his authority in this earth. And so they are going to be kings and priests of God. That is a, a title of the service of the nation of Israel for God. That's his purpose for them, as we can see already in the first two books of the o Old Testament. Uh, now, their problem was that they couldn't keep the law. <laughs> And, uh, and God gave them time. They said they could, and God showed them they couldn't. So come with me to the book of, of uh, uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31. If you attend our Sunday school, adult Sunday school class, we're surveying the Bible. And in that survey, you begin to understand the historical progress of God dealing with the nation of Israel as we go from uh, the time of their history in which they failed God and, and were brought into captivity and judgment and then how God raised up prophets to declare unto them how he is going to fulfill his promises to the nation of Israel. And when you're in the book of Jeremiah, you are into one of the prophets where God raised up to speak to the nation of Israel. Now I ask you to turn to, to chapter 31, but, but go back with me to, uh, uh, go back to chapter 23. No, I'll tell you what, go back to 17 first. Some of the things that I taught on at the last conference might be beneficial for you to to hear as well concerning the nation of Israel. Uh, they, they were set out to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, but they couldn't keep God's laws. Neither can you keep God's laws. The average person, you ask the average person if, uh, if they're saved, they're going to heaven, they say yes, and you ask them how do they know that, or what makes them think so, and they say, well, I keep the Ten Commandments. All you got to do is ask them to name the Ten. There's hardly anybody, even believers, that can name the Ten Commandments. And the last thing they could do is ever keep those Ten Commandments. They first can't keep it physically, but they can't keep it from their heart either. Uh, that is, in their heart is, is evil. And, and that's why their practice is evil, and we've all broken God's laws. Israel told God, all that you said we'll do, and that way we'll be this peculiar nation above all people, and we'll be a kingdom of priests. But when you read the Old Testament, all you see is Israel's failure. And, and God brings their failures to their attention. In Exodus chapter 17, it says, no, <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 1, it says, The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with a, uh, a point of a diamond. It is engraved upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of the altar. Israel's sins, they're not just uh, written there that they are easily erased. Israel's sins are written as with an iron. They're engraved in their heart. They're, 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 they're engraved as if a point of a diamond wrote their sins in their heart because their heart is like a rock. It's hardened to the things of God. And their sins stand right in front of them and can be seen by everyone. And Jeremiah is declaring the sins of the nation of Israel. Uh, notice these verses. Look down at verse 5. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in who? In man. And maketh his flesh his arm. That is, your arm of strength, the thing that's going to help you out, I'll do it. Cursed is the man who trusteth in man and maketh his flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord. The remedy is not found in man. Cursed is the man who trusted in a man. Say a, a man comes along and He's going to tell you a means that you can have your sins forgiven and, and tell you to do something to get your sins forgiven. You are either going to trust that man who's going to say, I forgive you of all your sins and put your trust in him, or you're going to go out and do something and put your trust in yourself that you've done something to have your sins forgiven. And you know what you're going to end up with? A curse. Cursed is the man that trusteth in man and maketh his arm his flesh. Uh, his flesh his arm, that is, the remedy in himself. Verse 7 says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. The hope of the nation of Israel is in the Lord. And your hope can only be found in the Lord. The remedy for our sinfulness is not found in ourself. It's found in the Lord. And the reason it's not found in yourself, verse 9 says this, The heart is desperately, uh, no, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give to every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. The heart, your heart, is called deceitful. It'll lie to you. 
It'll tell you that the things that are wrong are okay to do. And the things that are right to do, you don't really have to do. Your heart will lie to you. You'll, you'll justify yourself in sinful activity. Your heart is deceitful and it's desperately wicked. Ever since the fall of Adam and, Adam and Eve, there has been a nature that man has from his birth that we are called children of wrath. That we have a natural tendency to do evil, and that's just called our old nature, but that is our nature of man. That's why we cannot trust ourselves because our heart will deceive us and say we can, but the Bible says you can't because your heart is not only deceitful, it's desperately wicked. And so the nation of Israel, when they told God, we'll keep your laws, God says, okay, try it. And when you come to Jeremiah, he said, look at your sins are written with an iron pen. You can't trust yourself. But God still has a purpose for Israel. Come to chapter 31. Jeremiah 31. God knew they couldn't keep it. And when they finally should have learned that they couldn't keep it, then God tells them what he's going to do for them. Jeremiah chapter 31, look at verse 31. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. They end up being divided into two nations. That's why it's called the house of Israel and the house of Judah. But God has a, a new covenant for both of them. Israel in their entirety. God says, I have a new covenant. New in what sense? Well, look at verse 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt, which covenant they break, though I was a husband unto them. God told them in Exodus 19 when he brought them out of Egypt, he says, here's a covenant. If you keep my laws, I'll bless you above all people. You'll be a kingdom of priests unto me. They said, okay, we'll keep the law. And they didn't. They broke the covenant. And so now God had to judge them, and they're going through judgment in the time of Jeremiah. Does that mean God is not going to fulfill his purpose of Israel and use them as a kings and as priests in the earth? No, the remedy is in the Lord. Their hope is in the Lord. God said he'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Verse 33 says, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Now, this chapter in, in Jeremiah is talking about the days that God is going to judge the nation of Israel. He judged them way back here in the Old Testament, but there's coming a time where God's going to judge them one more time. It's called in Jeremiah chapter 30, the time of Jacob's trouble. You know about it as the tribulation period. It's the time that you read about in the book of Revelation where God is going to judge and purge the nation of Israel and destroy the Gentile powers. That judgment is coming, and it says, according to this in verse 33, this is the covenant that I will, that's a future covenant, right, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. God says, I'm going to take, you remember when he wrote the law the first time, he wrote it in stone for them to read and to keep it but they couldn't do it. What God's going to do this time, He's going to write it right in their heart. He's going to write His Word right in their heart so that they'll be able to keep it. That is, He's going to put it within them, the ability to keep His laws. He's going to put His Word, if God writes something, that's His Word, is it not? He's going to write His Word in their heart so that they will do the things He wants them to do, so that they'll become the people He wants them to be, so that they can do what? be kings and priests to the Gentiles so that the Gentile nations can come back to God and be blessed. So verse 33 says, uh, verse 34 says, and this shall uh, and they shall teach no uh, they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them saith the Lord and I will forgive their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. They're all going to know the Lord. They will not only know that Jesus Christ is their Messiah, they will know Him in the sense that Paul says, all that I might know Him. The power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His suffering, being made conformable unto His death. You and I have to study the Bible to know God and to know His Son, Jesus Christ. But God is going to take Israel one day and write His laws in their hearts and they're going to know Him. They're not only going to know who He is, they're going to know what He's like and what he wants out of them. 
and they'll, they'll have a heart that's tender toward the things of God, and they'll do the will of God in the earth. And that's the new covenant that God had promised to the nation of Israel. That's explained in another way, if you come back, uh, no, come forward, to the book of Ezekiel. There's Isaiah, uh, there's Jeremiah, Lamentation, then comes Ezekiel. And come to Ezekiel chapter 20, uh, 38, 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. Let me start in verse 23. Ezekiel 36, verse 23. This is also about the new covenant that's going to be given to the nation of Israel. And it says in verse 23, it says, And I will sanctify my great name which was profaned among the heathen. Paul says uh, over in the book of Romans when he indicts the Jews, he says, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Rather than being a testimony of God's holiness and his laws and his existence, Israel turned around and worshipped idols and lived sinfully and blasphemed the name of God. They were supposed to be a testimony of God. But God says here, I will sanctify my name. Even though they had uh, profaned it among the heathen, God says, I'm going to sanctify it. I'm going to make my name holy in the, in the sight of the Gentiles. And look how he's going to do it. It says, I will sanctify my great name, which, is, uh, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. God's going to be sanctified in Israel before their eyes. And, uh, and when the Gentiles see Israel as holy, then they're going to say, you know, the God of Israel is the true God, and His name will be sanctified. So look what He's going to do for Israel. He says, For I will take you from among the heathen, and will gather you out of all countries, and shall bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols uh, will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, a tender heart. It says in verse 27, And I will put uh, my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and keep my judgments, and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I give unto your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. God said to the nation of Israel, You have broken my laws, but I'm going to make you a new covenant. And when he says, I'm going to write my laws in your heart, for years I knew what that new covenant meant, but I didn't know exactly how God was going to do that. What was God going to do for Israel? In what way is he going to write his laws in their heart? Well, this explains it when you look in verse 26. A new spirit will I give you, or no, a new, a new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. Verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and keep my commandments. God's going to take His Spirit. That's a Holy Spirit, is it not? And He's going to put it in the nation of Israel and the Holy Spirit of Israel, within the nation of Israel is going to cause them to walk in His laws and keep His commandments. And then that's what it's called being sanctified in the sight of the Gentiles. And when the Gentiles see Israel sanctified this way, they'll know who the true God is and then the Gentiles will be converted by the Jews. So God is going to use the nation of Israel for the purpose that he said he was going to use them for. Come over to, go, you've got to go backwards now, the book before Jeremiah, which is three books back, is uh, the book of Isaiah. And I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 61, where you had your scripture reading. Now Isaiah 61, look at verse 1. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach, the good, uh, preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty unto the captives and to open the prison of them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn, to appoint uh, unto them that mourn in Zion, uh, to an, yeah, appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them the beauty for ashes and the uh, an oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, uh, that, he, that he may be glorified. So God is going to do something for the nation of Israel, and what this chart is up here for, on your own, and you, you need to do this homework, I can't do everything right now, you need to write down Luke chapter 4, 
I'll even let you find the verse that it happens at. And, and you'll read where Jesus Christ walked in a synagogue and He took their Bible in the synagogue and He read verse 1 of Isaiah 61. He read half of verse 2 where it says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And it says in, in Luke 4, He shut the book and went and sat down. And when they looked at Him, He said He was here to do those things. And when they looked at Him, He said, Today is the Scripture fulfilled in your ears. Because in the first coming of Jesus Christ... He came to preach good tidings of good things. And the good tidings that he's preached to them about is how Israel is going to become a kingdom in this earth for God. They are going to become a royal nation and a holy priesthood. God is going to establish a kingdom in this earth through the nation of Israel. Jesus Christ is going to come back and rule this earth. The earth belongs to him and he will take possession of it. And the good news to Israel is how they're going to be used in that kingdom. Now that kingdom, by the way, you need to, uh, the reason I left this chart here is it shows it bigger than the next chart I'm going to show you. But, but that kingdom, when you read it, and we'll read it in a moment in the book of Revelation, how it lasts for a thousand years, that kingdom is going to be set up on earth. And anybody who's ever prayed what's called the Lord's Prayer knows that he says to pray after this manner, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Where? in earth as it is in heaven. Israel was always looking not to go up to heaven. Never were the God going to use them up in heaven. God was going to use them here on earth as his kingdom people, as a priesthood to the Gentiles, and, and Jesus Christ is going to come and establish a kingdom here on earth. Initially, it'll be a thousand years, but it says of the increase of his kingdom and peace, there'll be no end. It says that, that he is going to reign forever and ever. And when you read the last chapters of the book of Revelation, there's a new heaven and also a new earth. And Jesus Christ is going to reign over both of those. And, and the nation of Israel, they're looking for that kingdom to come. That's the good news that's being proclaimed in verse 1. Let me do something else here as well. Now I want you to see that kingdom and understand that there's a tribulation, a time of judgment that's going to come first. But this chart also shows the same thing. It's a little bit, goes all the way back to where we started. There's Exodus chapter 19, so it's a little bit longer in detail. But God is coming. Jesus Christ came and he's preaching about this kingdom coming. Now it's shorter there because of the time length, but don't, don't lose sight of that kingdom. There's going to be a time of wrath. But remember he said that he was going to put a new spirit within him? In the book of Acts chapter 2, after Jesus Christ ascended back into heaven, he baptized the believing remnant of Israel with the Holy Spirit. And they began to go out and preach, and they're, they're preparing for a time of judgment, but then that kingdom is going to come. Interestingly, the Lord read verse 2 and said, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus Christ is proclaiming that the kingdom is coming. And then it says, then he shut the book. Because what the next event for the nation of Israel is after Jesus Christ came and preached to them, it says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and what? And the day of vengeance of our God. The next event for the nation of Israel is a day of vengeance of our God. And then he's going to come and comfort all who mourn. And they're going to have rest and they're going to go into the kingdom. You see that? But you know, the Lord shut the book after he said proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The, the day of vengeance hadn't come in the first coming of Jesus Christ. It'll come as a prelude to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And you know when the Lord shut the book, you know where he shut the book at? Prophetically, right where we are. We're not part of the day of God's wrath. We're not the nation of Israel. God stopped his dealings with Israel in, in the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter 9, saved Saul of Tarsus and made him Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, and, and offered an opportunity to be saved by the cross of Christ, by the grace of God, where's the word grace in there? There we go. <laughs> by, oh, I'm not going to miss it. By the grace of God, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and God has turned to us Gentiles in the day in which we're living in. This is not found in the Old Testament. That's why you don't see it in verse 2. He said, to proclaim the acceptable day of the Lord and the vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. You skip this whole section here. Because this is the revelation given to the Apostle Paul. Now, come over with me. Now, now, that new covenant is made with the nation of Israel. 
The day of Pentecost, the, the coming of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to look at those verses, but you see why the, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the nation of Israel. That's a taste of the new covenant. The book of Hebrews, chapter 6, says that when that Holy Spirit came, it was a taste of the world to come. Now, come over to uh, Hebrews chapter 8. You need to know this. Hebrews chapter 8. Now, now you're in the New Testament and heading toward the back part of the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Look at verse 7. It says in verse 7, it says, For if the first covenant had been faultless, then there should have no place been sought for the second. But finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So Hebrews is picking up with that information from Jeremiah, is it not? It's going back to the time of Jeremiah where Jeremiah promised that God would make a new covenant. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he said his blood is the blood of the new covenant. His blood provides the means by which Israel's sins can be erased and taken away and forgiven. The means by which God could then bless them with the Holy Spirit and then use him for their glory as he plans to do. They are going to be a kingdom of priests to God. They're going to be kings and priests to God. I'll show you in just a second. But, but when, so Hebrews is here writing, and the book of Hebrews is written to the Hebrews, the nation of Israel, reminding them of the new covenant. And he starts quoting Jeremiah. Uh, he says in verse 9, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them uh, uh, by the hand to lead them out of, out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant. And I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and will write it in their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall te not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. So he's saying, look, that new covenant is coming. He says in verse 12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith the new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which is old and decayeth, is, uh, which, is, uh, which decayeth and waxeth old, is ready to vanish away. Now you know why I read that? So that you'd realize when you're reading the book of Hebrews, and Hebrews starts preparing them for this wrath, that the new covenant hasn't totally come yet. He said, the old is vanishing and the new is coming. So it's still in the future before God is actually going to fulfill. They had a taste of the new covenant with the Holy Spirit, but God is going to save all of Israel and write his laws in their hearts. He's going to put his spirit within them and they are going to keep his laws, but it's still future past the day of Hebrews, isn't it? The time the, Hebrew, the book of Hebrews was written. A lot of times people say that what God, God is doing today, this is the new covenant. You're not Jews, why would I be telling you about it if it was? And, and in the book of Hebrews, the new covenant isn't come about yet. It's still future. It's going to come at the second coming of Jesus Christ, when Israel's sins are purged and then put away. Jesus Christ comes back, and then he's going to fulfill the new covenant. Watch the book of Revelation. Uh, I, I, by the way, on your own, you can read 1 Peter chapter 2, and right around verse 9, he tells the believing people that he ministered to of the Jews, that they are a royal priesthood and a holy nation. Because the Holy Spirit has been poured out to them, they haven't been set up yet, but he says you are that to God. Now come to Revelation chapter 20. In verses 1 through 3, that Jesus Christ came back in Revelation chapter 19. And, and then, and by the way, when he returns, Revelation 19 says in verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, I'm reading Revelation 19:15. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and, uh, and he shall tread the winepress of the fierceness of, uh, and wrath of Almighty God. Jesus Christ, in his second coming, is going to come back, and he's going to rule the Gentiles with a rod of iron. That means you step out of line, he's going to whack you on. How come it doesn't say he's going to rule Israel with a rod of iron? Because they're going to have his law in their heart. They'll never step out of line. They're going to be blessed. They're going to be called the planting of the Lord. They're going to be righteous when Jesus Christ comes back because of the new covenant that he's going to establish. In Revelation chapter 20, Satan is bound for a thousand years in a bottomless pit in, in the first three verses. In fact, in verse 3, 
It says, and, he, and they cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, Revelation 20, verse 3, and put a seal upon it that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. He, he's, gonna, he's not going to be able to deceive the nations, the Gentiles, anymore. Then after that he's going to be loosed. You know what he's going to do when he's loosed? He's going to deceive the nations one more time, and they're going to end up in a lake of fire. And, 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 and so God's going to try people's hearts after Jesus Christ reigns for a thousand years. And, uh, but, you know, why doesn't it say uh, that he won't deceive Israel anymore? Why does it say he'll deceive the nations no more for a thousand years? Because Israel will know him, right? It's the Gentiles who don't know him. And it's Israel's job during that thousand years is to teach the Gentiles the, the things that God has taught them. Verse 4 says, And I saw the thrones, and they, uh, and, up, and upon them, uh, and I saw the thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded, that is, they lost their heads, for the witness of Jesus, they didn't take the mark of the beast, for the word of God, which had not worshipped the, the beast, neither the image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived, and what else? reigned with Christ a thousand years. And the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power, and they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Those who died for the testimony of Jesus Christ during this thousand years, or during the seven years of wrath when the Antichrist is going to come and set up the mark of the beast, they might die for the testimony of Jesus Christ, but when he comes back, they're going to live again, and they're going to reign as if they're kings, and they're going to be priests of God in the earth for 1,000 years. And that's when God is going to use the nation of Israel to finally go out and convert the Gentiles. God is always calling the nation of Israel in their purpose in the earth. He calls them kings. Doesn't a king live where he reigns? Where is Israel going to live, not only for the thousand years, but forever and ever? In the homeland, right? <laughs> earth is their home. This is the place that God has for them. Kings don't reign somewhere else. They reign over their own land, over their own people. And the earth is going to be one to the Lord, and they're going to be at home in this earth. What does a priest do? He represents someone. He mediates in the place of a sinner to bring them to a holy God. You know, you can read in Zechariah how it says, Ten Gentiles will grab a hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew and say, Take us to your God, for we hear God is among you. Jesus Christ is going to live in Jerusalem during this time. And the way a Gentile can come to God is he's got to come through a Jew because they're going to be a kingdom of priests. You know, we live in a day where the Bible says today there's only one mediator between God and men. And it tells us who the mediator is. The man, Christ Jesus. We don't live in that age. We don't come to God through, through Jewish people. We come to God through the person of Jesus Christ. And today, that's the only mediator is. That won't be true over here. Gentiles will come through Israel that way. But we live in an age of grace. And this is my whole point. I told you it was taking a long way to get there. Last chapter I want you to look at is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. God is going to use the nation of Israel as he called them out to be. But you need to understand who you are. And after we established all of who Israel is, we come to Paul's epistles where Paul was sent to us Gentiles before the wrath ever came and before the kingdom has been established in the earth, and the Apostle Paul sends us the gospel of God's grace about the cross of Christ, offers us an opportunity to be saved, and then he tells us who we are and what we are in the world. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 14. It's extremely important for you to know how to be saved, and once you're saved, who you are. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter... Uh, Five. I got to get there. That's why I keep saying it. Second Corinthians five verse fourteen. It says, "For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we just we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead." Now you might not catch this, but you know when Jesus Christ died on the cross, the day before he died, 
He said, this blood is the blood of the New Testament, which is said for the remission of sins of many. Many? Didn't say all. Didn't say I'm dying for Gentiles. If his blood is called the blood of the New Covenant, who is he dying for? The nation of Israel. So that he could forgive their sins and set them up as kingdom of priests and a holy, a royal nation in the earth. When he was dying, with that, that communion before the cross, that didn't have you and me there mentioned. Certainly we were on his mind, that's for sure. Because that's what Paul's saying here. He now knows that Jesus Christ didn't just die for Israel, he died for all, everybody. And, and because of that, he says in verse 15, and, they that, uh, and that he died for all. See, there's the fact. He did die for all of us. He paid for our sins as well when he died on that cross. And he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again. To be saved, you need to know that Jesus Christ died for you so that you don't trust in your flesh, thinking you're good enough to go to heaven, when even the Jews who had the law couldn't keep it. You think you sinful Gentile can keep it? You can't. So we're sinners. But here's a verse that tells you that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did die for all. He paid for our sins when he died on that cross. He didn't have sins to pay for. He paid for ours. And when you trust the fact that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again for your sins, God says, you're saved. You have everlasting life. Because now you're trusting in God. You're trusting in the Lord to save you. Because that's what he did on the cross. You trust what he did there for you, and you're trusting in the salvation that God provided for you, and God says you're saved. But then, are you saved to live any way you, should, you want? Is that what your course in life is? No, it says in verse 15, And he died for all that they which live, uh, he died for all that they which live, and that is have his life, should not live unto themselves, but unto him that died for him and rose again. Now watch these verses. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Now, that might be tough for you, but understand this. When Jesus Christ walked in the flesh, we knew him as the king of Israel. We don't know him that way anymore. We know him now in his relationship with us Gentiles because God is doing something new. That's why it says, henceforth. This is how we knew Christ. This is how Christ is going to fulfill his relationship with Israel. But now we know Christ in a different way. We know him as the head of the body. We know him as our Savior. Not what he was going to do for Israel. So it says in verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's not talking about you becoming something new and different in yourself. That's something that God has saved you to be something new in the earth. Israel is a kingdom of priests, kings and priests of God. When he saved us, he made us a new creature. We're something new. If we're something new, then what are we in this world? Well, God, God is going to make Israel kings and priests. A lot of people think that's what we are, kings and priests. We're not priests. There's only one mediator in this world today, and it's the man Christ Jesus. You're not a priest. What are you then? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That's your ministry, reconciliation. Reconciliation is taking two people that, that have a problem and, and getting them to have peace. And that ministry of reconciliation is called, look at the next word. It says, uh, verse 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled unto himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, uh, to wit, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed to us the word of reconciliation. We're not a priest, but we have a message for this world called a message of reconciliation because God today is not holding man's sins against him. He's offering man salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ, and we have that message, and we're ministers of that word. Now look at verse 20. Here we are. Here's what we are. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. You're not a priest on this earth, and you're not a king in this earth, because, well, and I'll just make a statement now, you don't live on this earth. You know what an ambassador is? 
someone who lives somewhere else and is in another place representing his home country. And you know where our home country is? God has a place for us in heaven. In the meantime, until he takes us to heaven, he tells us, you're an ambassador on this earth. You're here on this earth in this foreign country to represent heaven's position. And that God in heaven has a word for everybody in this world to know. It's the word reconciliation. That no matter what a person has done in sinning against God, they can be reconciled through Jesus Christ. Here's the word that you're to share with this world. Verse 21. For God hath made him, that is, God made Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, he didn't have any sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The message that we have for the world today is that God made Jesus Christ to be sin for us. When he died on that cross, he was paying for my sins, and he had no sins of his own. That through Jesus Christ, I might have the righteousness of God in him. That I can be placed in Christ and be found with his righteousness by believing in what Jesus Christ did for us. That's the message that we have for the world. And what we're going to be talking about from here next week is about what it is to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Because you've been given a calling. Are you a good ambassador?